Okay, aloha everybody. Good morning, good almost afternoon. Uh, my name is Billy Mikey. I'm from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, by quick show of hands, who's been to Hawaii before? A handful of you. Awesome. You wish. Not yet. Not yet. You will soon. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the politics of technology and, and the politics of open. Um, I have quite a few slides, so I'm going to move pretty quickly. Um, but here's a brief outline of what I'm going to be talking about. Um, open, it assumes the use of technology in most cases. Um, where, where our activity in open is, is changing, practices and pedagogies are sort of coming to the forefront. Um, technology is not neutral, and so I'm going to show you why we should be um, asking non-technical questions of it. Um, it's pretty obvious, but our practice actually influences the emergence of new technology. And then what I want you to be asking yourself is, do you have a free relationship to technology? Um, and do you have a free relationship to open? Um, so real quick, my background, I, I earned a master's degree in ed tech in 2012. Um, I wandered around professionally a little bit. I, I spent a couple years at Creative Commons, learned about um, IP and open licensing and how great that is. Um, technology obviously was a very big part of that. Um, and then for the last few years, I've worked at the University of Hawaii. I'm the OER coordinator, OER technologist. Um, I build textbooks with faculty. We use press books and we do everything technically open, legally open. Um, and uh, now I've actually re-entered the academy. I am a, a PhD student um, with the Hawaii Research Center for Future Studies. Um, futures is not like looking in a crystal ball. It's really, there is something to it. There's a method, and I don't know a lot about it, um, but I'm gonna show you what I do know. Um, so this is Jim Dater. He, um, he founded uh, the, the research center at Manoa, the Manoa School, as they call it, in 1971. The Hawaii State Legislature actually established the research center um, it's in law. It actually would take an act of law to remove the research center from the university, from the state, which is unique. Um, these are the four futures that um, he, he claims that uh, most predictions actually fall into. Continued growth, essentially would continue on the same path. Collapse, which you know we might be looking at right now. Um, disciplined future is where we sort of learn to live within our constraints. Um, and a final one is transformation, transformative future. We actually uh, learn not only to live within our constraints, but develop new technology, new ways of working together, um, and sort of break free of what we're, you know, looking at right now. My research interests, um, I'm, I'm very critical in my work. I'm very critical in many aspects of my life. Um, many of you know me on Twitter for being that way. Um, but really what I'm trying to do is, is question power structures um, and sort of look at what's enabling or hindering collaboration. Um, IP law is a, a passion of mine. I've, I've been very focused on that since my time at Creative Commons. Um, I'm very focused on self-determination and people being able to do more um, and how law and policy actually influence that. Um, and I'm trying to myself and help you all do that too, um, encourage uh, the cultivation of a free relationship to technology and to openness. So uh, what is open and what are we actually doing here? Um, Open, some of us see opens, open as an end, some of us see open as a means to get somewhere. Um, you know, you're probably met, very familiar with these, uh, these parts, these things come out of the UN, UNESCO. Um, openness, equal access to knowledge and education is something that we're all sort of fighting for. Um, these, are, these come from the mission statements, the vision statements from these very prestigious organizations in the open movement, Mozilla, tech-focused, tech Wikimedia Foundation and the OE Consortium. These are folks that I look to. You know, you can, my, my slides are online. You can click through if you'd like to. But these are folks basically fo focusing on many of the same things, and that is uh, trying to help everyone everywhere um, gain access to, to what, they, what, what we can, what we have to, to better themselves. Um, social justice is a, is a big theme. It's very important. It's sort of intersecting my work, becoming a, a strand of my work. It's something that, you know, I've always sort of implicitly known it was something um, that we work for in open, but now I'm trying to look at the research and figure out, you know, who's published on this, what the themes are in that, um, and how policy and law and technology influence our ability to do that. Um, but the main thing to take away from this is that social justice open, a lot of it relies really on technology. These practices that we've been promoting, we're sort of developing and researching on, they really do rely on technology. Um, but at the same time, open is not a binary. Open is a spectrum. Open is something that is different to everybody in your own context. And so, you know, quoting uh, Catherine here, uh, we have to move beyond the open, closed dichotomies and 
uh, and even unified conceptions of openness. There will be new organizations coming about. There will be organizations who have never actually considered open before that all of a sudden think, oh, well, let's, let's have a special issue of our journal that talks about OEP. Let's do this and that. Let's, let's try open, and we should be open to that. Um, if you're familiar with Larry Lessig, um, 1998, he made a publication. Um, he recognized there are four constraints to human behavior, um, law, social norms, the market, and architecture. You can think of architecture as technological infrastructure. And so law, um, we have open licenses to help us get around that. Social norms, we're still working out how that's gonna, how it's gonna happen. The market or the financial end of it, um, open is not free, open costs money, and we're looking at sustainability models around that. And the architecture, the underlying uh, technological infrastructure is really important and it's often overlooked, which is why I'm here talking to you. Um, again, uh, this was a, an article focused on openness and social justice. Um, and again, these four themes came up, the social, the technical, the legal, the financial barriers to openness. So openness is not open closed. It's not a binary. There are multiple uh, barriers to it. And so we need to think of it in, a, in, in multiple ways. Again, open washing. Anybody heard of open washing before? Fopen? It's pretty fun to say, pretty fun to poke fun at people. Um, it's a real thing, you know, but arguments about open have existed for a long time. Richard Stallman has sort of held the line with what free software is. The typical person you run into on the street, when you, when you say free software, they think of free as in cost, and that's it. That's where the conversation ends. But if you look back, free versus open source software, free software, um, it really comes down to a matter of, of principles and sort of the ethics behind it. Not only can you just, not only can you see the source code running the software, but you have certain freedoms and obligations associated with it. Um, and a few years ago, when the, when the MOOC hype cycle sort of leveled out, um, we looked back at Coursera and edX and, and those folks and we realized that, you know, how open were they? <laughs> Um, open is also complex, and stewarding open is, is quite complex. Um, Creative Commons, um, they, they sort of ran into something uh, late last year. Flickr decided to change what they're doing, change their model, and uh, essentially a quarter of the digital commons globally was put at risk. Um, this is something we should pay attention to. This was a financial constraint, a financial barrier. Um, but it's writing on the technical infrastructure that we all use. I have thousands of photos on Flickr, but as of a few months ago, I have not uploaded anything to Flickr, partially um, because of my own values, but partially because Flickr is still blocking me from uploading even CC licensed work. Um, if you're in the EU, which many of you are, um, Article 13, many parts of the copyright directive are sort of problematic in terms of uh, digital sharing, digital linking, and that sort of thing. And then we have Sci-Hub on the right-hand side. And Sci-Hub, as much as you'd like to think Sci-Hub is actually expanding our access to knowledge, it's very problematic in a legal sense. Um, and I believe her, her name is Erica, the one who founded Sci-Hub. They're, they're constantly moving the, the URL, the domain, um, because different countries, different jurisdictions are sort of blocking, allowing, they're always sort of playing whack-a-mole trying to stop what's happening on Sci-Hub. But let's look back, let's rewind a little bit. Um, and what, what is your philosophy of technology? I'm not asking you so you can yell at me right now, but I want you to be thinking about this. Um, are we only thinking about technology in technological ways? It's something we really should be thinking about. Um, who controls the pipes and the roadways of information? Um, these, these are Google Slides, right? That's problematic. And if you're tweeting about this presentation, you're probably doing it on Twitter, and that's problematic. Who owns those roads? Who owns the pipes? So looking back, um, some earlier theories of technology, Martin Heidegger, as problematic as his career ended up being, um, he did recognize that technology is a human activity. Um, as humans, we sort of bring forth technology, bring forth things from nature. Um, and nature, it doesn't, doesn't reveal technology on its own. Humans have a role in that. Technology is not neutral. I think many of us can agree. It's, it's absolutely not neutral. Um, but when we regard technology as being neutral, Heidegger said, um, we will be delivered over to it in the worst possible way. That's a really scary thought. But again, this is from 1954. This is not new. We've had warning signs for a long, long time. Um, Foreman to Matter, this is uh, Gilbert Simondon, 1958. He talked about this idea of form and humans revealing uh, technology, bringing it into matter. Um, there's continuity between the technical and the natural. Um, technology will not reveal itself to us on its own. It takes us sort of bringing it out from nature. 
Uh, Simondone also commented on um, our relationship to technology, and he sort of defined, you know, as much as we don't like binaries, he sort of separated humans into two groups, the major technics and the minor technics. I'd consider myself um, a major technic, you know, uh, I, I would do that. Um, my mother is probably a minor technic. Um, but again, it's our relationship to technology. Are, do we choose to lift up the hood and see what's running underneath there? Or do we, do we just sort of put the key in uh, and turn it on and drive down the road? Um, and sort of it's our responsibility to have both, both groups, if there are two groups, or the entire spectrum involved in conversations about technology, technology if we really want it to, to bring about um, equity. We do have a very complex relationship to technology. Technology has changed the last 150 years, have brought about technology that's just kind of blown the doors open. You think about the clock as something of convenience, um, but keeping time and sort of uh, quantifying our day-to-day -day life is something that on its own is, is problematic. It's, it's part of our lives. We cannot escape it. Um, we need to be really careful about this. Um, capitalism, economic forces, are really sort of leveraging technology. This has been happening for a long, long time. Um, Mumford, he recognized this a while ago, and he, he recognized how capitalism and folks that are in charge of big businesses were going to leverage technology for their own purposes, to serve themselves, but probably not always to serve the common good. Um, and obviously, our, our contemporary interplay of tech and policy is just frightening. If you've read any of my blog posts about surveillance technology, um, you'll know that I am highly skeptical of what we're doing and how we're being tracked around the world. Um, this is our friend. Um, yeah, I'm going to move on. <laughs> um, and so, you, tech, you know, technological dystopias, we can, we can, they're really fun. I'm going to run few, through a few of them, but I don't want to burden you with them. Um, today's technology really is different. It's different than 10 years ago, different than 20 years ago. We've got to pay attention to what's happening. Um, Martin Weller, he, he <laughs> reluctantly published a blog post um, not that long ago, like last month, um, and he was asked to sort of look at the future of technology. Just to reiterate, reiterate this point, technology is not neutral. It's not ethically or politically neutral at all. And we're going to see this come up more and more. But again, you cannot look at technology and say that on its own, it's not going to do anything. Um, or on its own, it's, it's neutral. We are humans. We are involved in it. And it's, it's just rapidly it's speeding ahead. Uh, we're seeing technology that reinforces biases. Um, the folks that design the algorithms to help you find information, locate knowledge, they have their own biases. They, they're looking at not only um, how people are searching for information, but also when they write code, they are doing so with their own personal experience built into that. I recommend checking out um, Algorithms of Oppression by Sophia Noble if you have not. Obviously, I know Brexit probably came up once or twice, I apologize, um, but it's pretty obvious that technology is sort of interfering with politics and we're not really sure what to do with that and it's sort of a, a train that's running off the tracks. What's really frightening, because we're here for education, right, ed tech, is how technology is shaping students and shaping the future. The students that we're teaching, the students we're trying to um, help out, they are the future. But when we have a lack of trust, when we have a, a lack of, of personal interaction and sort of a, a rush to jump on the AI train and surveillance train, this is just really freaky. So. How am I doing on time? Six minutes. Left? OK, great. Uh, so just to close, because again, I'm, I'm in my first year of my PhD um, program, and my, my advisors don't really know what to make of me, which is kind of cool. Um, this is just the beginning. Um, but I want you to be thinking about your own philosophy of technology. Are you into open source? Do you care at all? Do you, use, do you write in Markdown? Do you use Microsoft Word? Are you a pragmatist, or do you just kind of do what's convenient? And how much of your philosophy of technology is influenced by your philosophy of open? Open is a spectrum. We all have our own entry points into open. Um, but it's heavily influenced by technology. We cannot divorce the two. Um, we also should be learning to question open. This was Viv Rolf from Open Ed 2016. I'm really surprised this kind of this hasn't come up more. Um, but she says, the open education community is critical within itself, but not of itself. 
Um, huge point, really, really important. I, I'm probably going to be publishing on critical approaches to open and open technology, um, but this is so easily forgotten. Um, possible futures, so this is uh, Debbie Halbert. She's my um, PhD supervisor right now. Um, she says, futures can open our eyes to how we colonize the future with assumptions about linearity and inevitability and help us decolonize the future by opening up alternatives. I mentioned the four futures earlier on. Again, this is not crystal ball magic. This is looking ahead and seeing what are the constraints we're working in, where might things lead to, what are, what are the worst case scenarios, what are the possible trajectories, um, and, and look at where we are, where we'd like to be, but also plan for like, wow, if this really goes bad, where, white, where might we end up? Last thing, and kind of rewinding again to Martin Heidegger, he said, the closer we come to the danger, the more brightly the ways into saving, the saving power begin to shine, and the more questioning we become. For questioning is the piety of thought. This is really important. Never give up your curiosity. Always question things, even if you, you are so certain of certain things. Um, always question them, and I think that that's part of the responsibility of being in open, is to keep an open mind and never be, uh, never take a positivist approach. So, I'd like you to do more or do different and maintain a free relationship to open if you can. If you can't, then let's talk about it. Let's figure out how to actually do that. So I have lots of citations, or a few rather, at the end, but I'd like to just open it up to questions. And please use a microphone for accessibility purposes, really. I just wanted to link two of the things you said towards the end of your talk and, and, and ask you a question about them. Viv talked about being critical of our, you know, uh, open being critical of itself. And then you mentioned um, futures, which I just wonder how often we or other people go back and look at the futures that they envisaged as a way of being critical about themselves. Futures seem to often just look forward, really, not mm -hmm. go back and look at what they said five years ago or ten yeah, years ago. That's a great comment, great question, yeah. You know, futures as a field, it's been around since the early 70s, or even before that, if it might not have been formalized. Yeah, quite a bit longer. Um, and we don't often review what the, the futures ha that had been projected are. Um, so that's a great point, absolutely. Or Brian. <laughs> um, you made a provocative aside about Flickr, and I, I won't delve into the why you're not allowed to upload unless you want to elaborate. <laughs> but uh, it reminded me of, I think we had a Twitter exchange uh, a month or two ago. There was a, a good news story uh, when Flickr was bought out, um, and, uh, and the, the, the good news stories was the images that were CC licensed were not going to be deleted, um, and that was a cause for a lot of celebration online. Uh, and then it was maybe just a coincidence, but it was enough of a coincidence to stoke my paranoia that I think is that about a week later, we learned that uh, Flickr's Creative Commons licensed images were being used by IBM to uh, develop their facial recognition software. And it got me thinking about the extent that, uh, or a critique that's been leveled um, that things like Creative Commons and certain elements of kind of the open industry that are funded by corporate interests to an extent that open is something of a stalking horse for corporate interests. And I just wonder if you have thoughts on that critique. Yeah, not too much. Um, just to say that um, open can also be fragile. And so when we looked at how easily um, a quarter of the digital commons were put at risk by Flickr and our ability to grow the commons was put at risk purely based on market forces. Um, that just shows that, you know, it's, it's not certain. There are, there are things that we are not anticipating that will come up. This is not the, the end of it. Um, what has already been built, you know, it, there's no guarantee it's going to be there tomorrow. And so we kind of have to turn it back on ourselves um, to, to look at our own practices and figure out, you know, how to, how to do better, do different. Uh, thank you, Billy. That was really fascinating and very provocative. I think it's good to be <laughs> provoked uh, in these uh, uh, sessions. 
Um, at the University of Edinburgh, which I've just joined, so I had no uh, involvement in this work, they've just done a piece of work led by Sean Bain called Near Future Teaching, which is imagining what they're calling a preferable future. And I just wondered, with all of these possible futures, and you put up the slide with the four different kinds of future, do you have a sense in your mind of what the preferable future of open looks like? That's a fantastic question. Simon, I don't. <laughs> I really don't. Um, but, you know, uh, being able to outline what preferable futures or aspects of a preferable future might look like, that's a great exercise, and maybe we should be doing that more and incorporating that more into open.